May I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist. This is the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science and technology. With me, Chris Smith, and with Adam Murphy. This week, we are breaking codes and cooking up ciphers. We're looking at the world of cryptography. Coming up, Cold War spy rings, and can you make an unbreakable code? And in the news, seagulls and superbugs, and why it's harder to keep the weight off as you get older. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Now, arguably, the really big news this week is that scientists in the UK have tracked down what might be a habitable world orbiting a distant star. The planet is called K218b, and Ingo Waldman told me what his team's discovered and how they did it. We found a planet outside our own solar system which is rocky and it has an atmosphere which is potentially habitable. That means it has the temperatures that may allow liquid water to exist on its surface and it has an atmosphere and that atmosphere has water vapour in it. Sounds amazing. Where would I need to look in the night sky to, to be able to see where this is and how far away is it? It's in the constellation of Leo and it's 110 light years away from us. So it's not the closest, but it's also not the furthest exoplanet we've ever discovered. And how did you find it? The Kepler mission discovered this planet, and the Kepler Space Telescope discovered the planet using uh, the transit method. And the transit method means that the planet um, orbits in our line of sight to the star. So it goes between us and the star. So that means that light of the star dips slightly whenever it goes in between our line of sight. And that's how you discovered these planets. That tells you it's there. How do you then interrogate what it's made of? The fact that you told me it's a rocky world, that you've got signatures of water there. How are you doing that? The fact that it's a rocky world, we know from its density. So we know its mass. So it's about eight Earth masses. And its radius, we know from the transit measurement, and that's about two Earth radii. So that's about the density of Mars. So that tells us that there is a rocky core inside. Now, what we've done is we um, took Hubble Space Telescope observations to measure the atmosphere of the planet. And the atmosphere is measured by observing the same transit as the planet goes in front of the star, but observe the tiny little speck of stellar light that filters through the atmosphere while it goes in front of the star. And how does looking at the light coming through the atmosphere tell you what chemicals are there? Different chemicals absorb light in different ways. So at different frequencies of light, you have a very characteristic signature of the chemicals. So if we observe the transit at different wavelengths of light, uh, we can identify what chemicals are in the atmosphere. And when you tot up what you see, what is the recipe for the atmosphere of this distant world? Well, so far, we've discovered water only. So we've discovered that there is an atmosphere around this planet, which is a world first. So this is really exciting because we had never discovered an atmosphere around a habitable planet. And so far, we've only seen water because the Hubble Space Telescope is only sensitive to the water feature. And there are probably going to be more molecules, such as methane, acetylene, ammonia, and so on and so forth. But we are just not quite sensitive to that yet. And how do you know the temperature? Because you're saying it's a habitable world. What would it be like on that planet? So the temperature you can quite easily calculate from the distance of the planet from the star. So the planet orbits its star, and it's a small red star, in 33 days. So every Earth month is a year on Kepler-18b. That means that the radiation on the surface of that planet is just enough to keep water liquid. So the surface... Conditions are probably okay, but we don't actually know what the surface is like at the moment. It could be a water world, or it could be entirely barren and rocky. Given you've got this set of findings, you now have a a relatively small planet, quite similar to our own, with evidence of water. How does this shift the balance of probability that when we look out into the universe, 
that there are other worlds probably like our own out there? Well, I mean, that's the exciting bit, right? So this is hopefully only the first of many to be found in the next couple of years. What about the thing that I guarantee everyone listening to this is going to be thinking, well, if there's a habitable planet out there, could it be inhabited? Well, that's the million-dollar question, and we don't know whether there's a biosphere on that planet yet because Hubble is not sensitive to the chemical fingerprints of life. Now, the James Webb Space Telescope will be sensitive to those. And I bet you all my tiny little research salary that we will spend a significant amount of the James Webb time observing this planet. It might well be that we find a atmosphere which is what we call out of equilibrium, chemistry that cannot be explained by natural processes other than our life. So in our Earth example, if you look at the Earth from afar, what we would see at the existence of methane and oxygen and ozone. Now, on that planet, we don't know what that might be. It might be very similar because life may have evolved in a similar way, but we just don't know yet. It's all inspiring stuff, isn't it? Ingo Waldman there, he's from University College London. The paper describing that discovery has just come out in the journal Nature Astronomy. Now, two years ago, we were joined here in the studio by Dr Sani Aliu. He's an infectious diseases consultant from Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. And he was here because he was about to embark on a secondment to Nigeria. And he was going to go there to study HIV. Now, Nigeria is one of the world's most populous countries. It's also got one of the world's highest burdens of HIV disease. In his role as Director General of the National Agency for the Control of AIDS in Nigeria... Sani set up and ran the largest HIV-specific survey ever conducted. He's now returned and has come in to report on what his survey showed. So first, Sani, why is counting cases of HIV helpful? Well, it's important because um, HIV, as we know, is an epidemic. You need to know the numbers in order to know how much resources you need to put in. Uh, You also need to know the numbers in order to define where the location is, what the population risks are, etc. In other words, uh, for you to have impact, both in terms of testing and putting people on treatment, you need to have an idea of the data. Data is what drives programming. And that's why it's so critical to have a survey that's accurate, that's good, and that can allow us to, to invest money properly. Now, surely this study didn't cost nothing, so wouldn't it have been better to buy, say, anti-HIV medication with that instead of this? Well, in the first instance, you need to identify people living with HIV first before before you buy the HIV drugs and put them on treatment. And the only way you can do that is knowing where to target. In other words, um, hotspots. And what surveys do is they allow us to identify the main risk factors within a population, what we call a population location approach. So the population that's most likely to have HIV and then allows us to know exactly where to put our resources in. So in other words, you'll be throwing good money after bad money if, if, if you don't know what you're targeting. In fact, the Nigeria program was a typical example. The U.S. government have spent more than $4.5 billion U.S. dollars on HIV in Nigeria over the last 15 years. Global fund more than $1.5 billion. But despite that, we're still pretty far off from identifying people living with HIV. Sani, it's soon going to be 40 years since we first discovered the virus that causes HIV AIDS. Why is it only now you're collecting this sort of data in Nigeria? And why just focus on Nigeria? Why not Why not the whole world? So uh, as you said earlier on, Nigeria has a very large population, about 200 million people. And uh, before we did our survey, the estimates in terms of HIV burden was about 3 point, uh, we estimated about 3.2 to 3.4 million people were living with HIV, which made Nigeria have the second largest HIV burden in the world. I mean, that's one in 10 of the world's HIV exactly. patients. Exactly. So if you're, if you're really talking about epidemic control, you cannot have epidemic control without getting on top of the HIV problem in Nigeria. This is the first time that money has been invested properly in a survey to define the problem because I think our own partners realize that they can continue chasing cases, testing thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to get a few positives. We need to be able to test a few hundreds in order to get positives so that we can put money, we can have the greatest impact when it comes to our investment. So what did this study actually find then at the other end? In summary, we had three or four findings. Um, First of all, the burden of HIV, the prevalence of HIV turned out to be half of what was initially expected. So we estimate about 1.9 million people are living with HIV in Nigeria now instead of the 3.2, 3.4 million initially. So the prevalence went down from 2.8% to 1.4% for ages 15 to 49. So that's huge. Secondly, we realized that there were a lot more women 
having HIV than men, although globally that's the case. But what was even more significant was that young women were at least three times more likely to have HIV than young men of the same age group. Does this mean you can strategically target better? If you know that now, you can go in and target certain demographics, certain groups, certain geographies much more specifically than we could before. So before it was just a blanket bomb approach, we've got a problem with HIV in Nigeria and countries like it. Now you've got this data, you can, you can be much more strategic. Absolutely. So I'll give you an example. In the northwest of Nigeria, the HIV prevalence was 0.6%. In the south-south, it was 3.1%, five-fold. So really where we should be investing, where we should be putting money, is where we have the problem. So in the past, we've been putting money mostly in, in the North Central, and we've saturated the North Central, as was seen by the population level virological suppression rates, which were pretty good. They were more than 60% in the North Central. But in other parts of the country, particularly the South-South, the numbers were so low in terms of the number of people on treatment and virologically suppressed. And if you're virologically suppressed, you do not transmit the virus. That's the best way to cut the epidemic, really. So in a way, this has allowed us to identify the areas, the location, identified the people that are most at risk and put more resources in. In fact, the U.S. government in March, we had a meeting in Johannesburg and they have put forward money to put half a million Nigerians on treatment between now and the end of December 2020. So if that trend continues as a public health threat, HIV will cease to be a public health threat in Nigeria. And it's simply because of the value of the survey we've had. But just very briefly, 30 seconds, why should someone who doesn't live in Nigeria care about what you've found? Why is this important? Uh, from a human, human angle, it's important that we make sure that those that do not have the money to be able to have treatment are provided with that opportunity. The only reason why we still have, we have about 1.1 million Nigerians on treatment is because they have been on treatment for a while. If today that treatment is taken away, most of them will be dead within five years. In fact, we looked at the burden of the HIV epidemic in Nigeria. Without a HIV program in Nigeria, we would have had at least 1.5 million more people dead and we would have had at least 5 million Nigerians infected with the virus by now. Sani Aliyu, thank you very much for that. Hi, my name's Phil Sanson, and I want to tell you about a very special Naked Scientist podcast. Are you the kind of person who's made up of cells? Do those cells contain the genetic code for everything about you? If so, then Naked Genetics is the show for you. Each month, we're telling scientific detective stories and voyaging across the wild oceans of DNA. From sequencing a dog... <coughs> Bruce? Biscuit? To tearing apart a flower. Oh boy, you've taken all the parts off. Well, that one I messed up, so that shows you how, how good he had to get at this. To drinking a bunch of gin. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Very refreshing. You don't want to miss out. Subscribe to Naked Genetics wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come here on The Naked Scientist, seagulls and superbugs, and is your beard dirtier than a dog? Well, while you ponder that, ponder this. Regrettably, as we get older, it seems to get harder and harder to stop yourself piling on the pounds. Well, now a study that used the fallout from historic nuclear bomb tests to measure the rates at which people burn fat has enabled biologists in Sweden to confirm this really is a fact. You do gain weight as you get older, and it isn't your fault everyone's rate of burning fat drops with age. And Phil Sansom heard why from Kirsty Spaulding. We decrease the rates at which we burn fat as we age. It's quite a simple message. If you don't adjust how much you eat over the lifespan, you will gain weight. We followed people for up to 16 years and roughly over a 13-year period. Those people that didn't adjust the amount of food they ate they went up roughly by about 20% in their body weight. What's surprising about that? I don't think it's particularly surprising. I think it's just that it's the first time it's been scientifically proven. In this study, we were actually able to take a biopsy from a person at the beginning of the study and then later take another biopsy so we could really see what is happening within one individual as they age. The tricky thing to measure here is the rate that your body turns over fat cells, burns old ones and makes new ones. When she does a biopsy, Kirsty needs to figure out how old the cells are that she's looking at. And they have an ingenious solution that uses, of all things, nuclear bombs. 
So during the 50s and 60s, the period of the Cold War, there was a lot of above ground nuclear bomb testing. And there's a significant increase in the levels of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere. And so what we see is that these radioactive levels shot right up. And then around 1963, when the test ban treaty came into effect, these values start to go down exponentially. The radioactive carbon is called carbon-14, and you can get a graph of how the ratio of carbon-14 to normal carbon in the atmosphere went down every year after the test ban. We incorporate the atmospheric levels of carbon that are represented in the plants, get incorporated into our body. So we look at the ratio of the radioactive carbon to stable carbon in the triglycerides, the fat cells. That ratio gives you the date the fat cell was made, and voila! I had expected that we would find middle age, perhaps. That was when you would see the effect of the decrease in the burning rate of fat. But actually, we found it across the lifespan. So even in people at the start of the studies that were in their 20s, they equally reduced the turnover rate of their fat cells. So it's not like we're all fine until suddenly we hit 50 or 60, and then it starts to decrease. Kirsty and her colleagues did a second study where they followed women who had just undergone bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery. They were looking at whether the women would gain weight again straight afterwards. What could be predicting and contributing to those women that maintained the weight loss and those women that didn't? Intriguingly, it wasn't the obvious things like their BMI, their body fat at the start of the study, their age. It was the rate at which they turn over the fat. Two thirds of the, the women that actually had a, a low burning capacity they were the ones that actually had significant weight loss. Five years later, they managed to maintain the weight loss. It sort of suggests that they have an ability to increase the rate at which they burn their fat that enables them to maintain the weight loss all these years after the surgery. I mean, the fact that they had a slow burning rate of fat in the beginning might have been what you know, also predisposed them to becoming obese, but this was strongest predicted who was going to go on to maintain weight loss and who wasn't. So it's a confusing picture. But the key message is that your body's rate of burning fat makes a big difference to putting on weight. But what can you actually do about it? The old mantra that no one really wants to hear or they want the magic answer is exercise. Exercise is one of the major ways to increase the rate at which you burn fat. This is common sense and this is commonly known, but this scientifically really hammers home this point. But it also opens up an avenue for therapeutics. Potentially, if you can stimulate the rate at which you burn fat. I mean, this now is the target. But there is no commonly accepted therapeutic right now that will increase the rate in which you burn fat. There is no magic pill. So, alongside Benjamin Franklin's death and taxes, another of life's certainties is middle-aged spread, it seems. Oh, dear. That was Kirsty Spalding from the Karolinska Institute. His paper is out in the journal Nature Medicine. Now... Recently, we were advised that, to stop a seagull stealing our chips and ice creams at the seaside, we should just stare at them. But a recent study also revealed that gulls are making off with something else much more serious. And this is something that staring isn't going to stop. They're picking up our superbugs. In Australia, one in five seagulls studied was harbouring antibiotic-resistant human bacteria. I went to see the scientist behind the study. I'm Sam Abraham. I'm a microbiologist from Murdoch University. Seagulls across Australia are carriers of bacteria that are resistant to drugs of last resort, the ones that we really need the doctors to have to save our lives. So we went across Australia to pretty much most states. We took the seagull droppings and then played them onto agar plates, which are infused with certain drugs. Then we took the bacteria out to confirm they are absolutely resistant bacteria. Are they resistant in the same way that those sorts of bacteria that cause infections in humans are resistant? Absolutely. They are identical. So if you have infection with this bacteria from these gulls, you cannot treat with the drugs available. Where did the gulls get it then? It's a very interesting question. In Australia, we have a lot of gulls all around in beaches, parks, everywhere. They are typically marine feeders, but they also picked up a habit of foraging on food waste. So if you come to Australia, you will get your chips attacked by our gulls. My sat-nav counselled me to do the windows up and don't let the seagulls steal my chips. 
And, yes. and you think that's how they catch, they get these bugs? Uh, that's one of the ways they interact with us. But they interact with human waste from landfill. They also hang around in our sewage. And there is a lot of contact with drug-resistant bacteria, say, for example, bread in hospitals or nursing homes. So there's a lot of antibiotics used. And if the gulls are foraging for food in that area, they get exposed to it. Would gulls normally have E. coli living in their intestines? Normally, we wouldn't expect these bacteria to be part of gull gut. These are human pathogens. So it is actually not the gull bacteria picking up the resistance. It's actually resistant bacteria from humans going into the gulls. There is no genetic differences between the bacteria we got out of the gulls and the bacteria causing disease in humans. Do you think it's just here in Australia? Something inside me says absolutely not, because gulls are everywhere, and human practices about how we handle our rubbish, our waste and our sewage, they're going on everywhere as well. Absolutely. If you have the similar foraging habits, similar waste treatment, and the birds have the same behaviour, it will be global, global phenomenon. And it's just in Australia we did a very comprehensive study to prove that this is there, and I'm sure it will be the same in the UK or in New Zealand or even US. And just gulls, are you going to extend this to other birds? Because there are lots of other foragers, crows, the crow family, magpies, for example, they're really good at picking through rubbish, and they, they hang around where the same sorts of places that gulls do. Do you think that the same phenomenon may well emerge there. Yeah, that is an area that we are studying. So gulls are what we call colonial breeders. They live in large colonies with limited predation. Any bird that has scavengers and have similar lifestyle to gulls, we expect to see that. So we are looking at ibises, ducks. We have a study running in penguins and pigeons as well. So would you anticipate that because they're these colonial breeders, they're hanging around in big groups, that as soon as one picks this up, it's going to poop it out into the environment where the others are all hanging around. So even if only one picks it up initially, it can quite quickly establish in the rest of the colony. Is that why you've got this dramatic prevalence? That's the hypothesis that we're working on at the moment, because the colonial breeding habitat also provides for the accelerated dissemination. Closing the loop, it's gone from a human into a gull, and quite possibly other bird species as well, evidence that it could come back or feed back into and cause human infection again? It goes back to your sat-nav that's giving you some information about what to do with gulls. So it's to do with if you interact with the same areas where the gulls interact and live, beaches, parks. So, for example, my child going and playing in uh, play equipment that had fresh seagull dropping, and if he goes and plays and put his hand on, on some fresh dropping and accidentally put his uh, hand in the mouth, and he's going to immediately get inoculated. That is where our uh, public health concern for this finding lies, actually. It's worrying, isn't it? Sam Abraham there, he's at Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia, and he's published those results in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Now, sticking with bacteria, what's got more bugs lurking in it? Dog fur or a human beard? This subject's been going up the agenda because a shortage of scanners for veterinary use means machines intended for humans are increasingly also being used to image our pet dogs, leading some people to wonder about infection risks. Well, to sniff out an answer, we let naked scientists Ben McAllister and Ruby Osborne off the leash to investigate. And in the interests of confidentiality, the names of some of the furrier subjects in this report have been bleeped out to protect their identities. Recently, there's been a lot of hullabaloo about the relative cleanliness of dogs and humans, with a study from the journal European Radiology finding that, on average, men's beard hair contains higher populations of bacteria than dog fur. That's interesting and a bit gross. Well, what did they find? They swabbed dog fur in 30 dogs and people fur in 18 adult men and compared the bacteria found in each. Dr Goodsight commented that the study showed that humans and animals are very similar and the paper explains that they actually found slightly higher populations of bacteria on average on the men's faces. An astute listener will note at this point that I know how to grow facial hair. And I know how to test things for bacteria. So, given this show's called The Naked Scientists and not just the naked people who talk to you about stuff, we went to the Queen's Veterinary School here at Cambridge University to see how I compared to a dog. We're here with... David Williams, I'm a veterinary surgeon here. Well, who else is with us, Ruby? I have my two test subjects. I have the black Labrador. 
And also Ben, an Australian man. Woof. And we're going to find out who's got more bacteria. Uh, David, who do you think is going to have more bacteria in their hair? Do you think it's going to be here or do you think it's going to be me? Well, I would have thought it would be because doesn't uh, uh, wash herself on a daily basis. <laughs> and I hope that, that you might. That makes some sense, but I guess the proof is in the swabbing. So let's get down to it, shall we? I'm going to swab his neck. Come here, Danny. There we go. Good girl. She's certainly wagging her tail. Aren't you a good girl? Okay, one sample down. And swab number two. I'm very nervous about this one. Okay, all done. As well as Ben's beard, I also swabbed his hairless cheek to see if it's really the beard that's the problem, or just humans' faces. Our doggy helper showed low amounts of bacteria, actually lower than any of the dogs in the original study. And then there's Ben. Oh dear. Ben's beard did in fact contain high levels of bacteria, five times more than the moderate amount on his cheek. Even though I just washed it that morning. So it seems our little experiment... Which is not very rigorous, by the way, with just one person and one dog. Stop trying to get out of it, Ben. Our little experiment supported the paper's findings that human beards contain more bacteria than dog fur. There's also the question of if bacteria being present in dog fur or human fur is really that big of a problem to begin with. Bacteria are everywhere. Keyboards. Phones. Doorknobs. Handrails. You get the idea. Whether or not bacteria are denser in a human beard than in a dog's fur, a beard is probably not the only bacteria-dense thing you'll come across in your day-to-day -day life. The study authors even said there's no reason to believe that women may harbour less bacteriological load than bearded men. So leave us beardies alone. We're no worse than the rest of you. Yep, beards are fine. You should probably still wash them regularly, though. I do! Well, then it's fine. Some would say cool, even. Some might, although our research found no evidence to support that assertion. Oh. <laughs> well, that should give you some pause for thought, shouldn't it? Thank you very much to Ben McAllister and Ruby Osborne for their analysis. Now it's time for the mailbox. This is the part of the show where we read out your correspondence. So Mark Jacobson is pondering how a tank can move forward on its continuous track. Chris, what do you think? Right, well, this is very similar to the way that a digger on tracks actually moves. Inside those tracks, there's a cog on each end of the digger and that cog engages with a groove on the underside of the track and as the cog moves around in the same way as a bicycle crank moves a bicycle chain it actually advances the track and because the track is basically being picked up at one end and laid down at the opposite end the digger rolls forward inside the track it's laying forward and the enormous surface area that you've got with those tracks against the ground means you get an enormous amount of traction which is why things like big heavy earth museum machinery and tanks use them. Brilliant. And meanwhile, Nev asks, why does the time on my digital wristwatch always end up being five minutes ahead within three months? I always turn it back, but it still jumps ahead. Every digital wristwatch I have ever had did this. Yeah, I'm with you, Nev. It happens to me as well. The reason is that lots of these watches use crystals. They actually use a piezoelectric crystal. Basically, what you do is you apply a small electric current to the crystal. The crystal is very finely shaped so that it vibrates when you put the electricity in and it vibrates a bit like a miniature tuning fork and it does it usually in those crystals 32,768 times a second which means you can use that to work out roughly how fast the watch is ticking but it does that at a certain speed which is determined by the temperature and if you warm the watch up it will vibrate a bit faster if you cool it down it will vibrate a bit slower and because most people's watches are not very well insulated and they're not at a constant temperature there's a wandering of that vibrational frequency of the crystal so the watch timekeeping wanders really high quality watches and timepieces do two things one they insulate the crystal to stop the temperature variations happening so much and also they incorporate machinery to correct for temperature variation but cheap watches like your two pound 51 you get from a christmas cracker don't do that so you just have to put up with the fact you're going to be either very early or very late for your meeting pretty quickly thanks for that chris and all the stories covered this week are on our website alongside references at the naked scientists.com and if you'd like to leave us a review to tell us what you think of the programme and give us some feedback, please do that on whatever podcast platform you're using. And also, if you have a question for the programme for us to consider in the mailbox, you can send that in. It's chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast is produced in association with Spitfire, cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music is 
music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound, perfect music for your audio and video productions. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Adam Murphy. And this week we're going undercover to explore the science of spycraft, codes and encryption. First up, we're winding back the clock to look at one of the most famous code-breaking endeavours, the effort to crack the Enigma code. Now with us is mathematician James Grime. You've actually got one of these, haven't you? Yeah, well, I, I, I look after one, yes, I can say that. <laughs> so what, what does it actually look like? So what people should imagine is it looks like a typewriter. I try to imagine an old-fashioned 1930s typewriter, but it doesn't print on paper. It's got two sets of letters. So when you type your message, actually your code lights up on the second set of letters. Uh, inside the machine are three wheels, which are called rotors, and those rotors move. There's a fast rotor, a middle rotor, and a slow moving rotor kind of like uh, hands on a clock like it's a minute hand hour hand second hand it's the same action and then at the front of the machine is something called the plug board and the plug board is just a, a set of wires and if i move those wires around it's going to change the code as well so that's an extra level of scrambling at the front of the machine thank you very much james and well, more from james in just a second he'll he'll be back but having set the scene and described to you what the enigma machine is like now we're going to hear how adam got on when he went to the science museum down in london where he spoke to Elizabeth Bruton, who's the curator of a brand new exhibition down there, all about cryptography and the Enigma code. Cryptography, or hiding information so no one can see it, has a long and storied history. From ancient times right up to today, people have wanted to hide their sensitive data. One of the most famous cases of this was in World War II and the German Enigma code. So we're in an area that looks a little bit like a Bletchley Park hut during the Second World War. That's the centre for British code breaking in the lead up to and indeed during the Second World War. And the initial display relates to the Polish contribution to cryptography and indeed to breaking the Enigma cipher system used by the German military before and indeed during the Second World War. So one of the rarest objects we have on display, and one we're truly honoured to have here, is an Enigma copy or an Enigma double loaned to the Science Museum for the duration of the exhibition by the Pulsudski Institute. Um, now, from sort of the early 1930s onwards, Polish cryptographers and mathematicians were able to intercept field messages sent by the German military using the Enigma cipher system. They'd also had a copy of the civilian version, and through this and some, I suppose the best way of describing it, some skullduggery in terms of describing the parts, they were able to essentially reverse engineer a German military Enigma cipher machine, having never actually seen one. They produced a design which they built from sort of the late 1930s through to the 1940s when they transferred themselves from Poland to France after the fall of Poland in, uh, 19, in late 1939. And this is the very machine we have on display. Fewer than 100 were made before and during the Second World War. And as far as we know, only two have survived. And we have one on display here. So the British weren't the first to take a shot at breaking Enigma. But what was Enigma and how did it work? And what some people may not know is that Enigma was first and foremost a civilian system designed to keep radio traffic of banks and post offices and other commercial ventures secure. It was purchased by the German military in the late 1920s and from there on the civilian version was no longer sold and the more complex military version which had a plug board which significantly increased the number of options and therefore complexities of uh, possible settings was used as the main field communication systems across all three branches of the German military from the late 1920s through to the end of the Second World War. Those who worked with it believed that it was unbreakable and that there was millions of billions of possible combinations and in order to try out every single possible settings, bearing in mind the settings changed daily, so it wasn't that you had forever, it would have taken more than the lifetime of the universe if you did it manually. And indeed that is the case, but there was a number of weaknesses of the Enigma cipher system. For example, it couldn't encrypt a letter as itself, so A would never be encrypted as A. You could produce these cribs, which is where you made a very educated guess as to some feature of the message, whether it was the opening thing, for example, maybe someone opened or finished a message with Heil Hitler, or it could be a weather report, which had a very standard form. So if you knew the form of the weather report and the weather as it was at that particular location, then you could make a very educated to guess as the content and if you know what the decrypted version of it's going to be you can essentially map the encrypted onto the decrypted to try and 
make a educated guess as to the key, the different settings of the rotors and plug boards and so on that it was set to. But it was a race against time because you had essentially 24 hours before the key setting changed and you're almost back to square one. What was the answer then? What was the enigma antidote? The British used a system called BOMB, B-O-M-B-E, based on a manual version developed by the Poles, and essentially it tried a number of possible key settings until it found a possible version that didn't sort of clash with their thought of what an encrypted to decrypted letter was. Then they would stop, they would check that with an adapted British Typex machine, that is the British cipher machine, see if a message was produced in comprehensible German. If it was, then they'd found the key setting for that particular network for that particular day. If it wasn't, then they would go back again and try again until they found the key settings. And we'll be back with Elizabeth a little while later on to see how encryption advanced through the years. First of all, let's take a look at at the maths and a bit more of the history of this, because remember with us is mathematician James Grime, also the proud custodian of an Enigma machine. I didn't realise until I listened to what Elizabeth was Mm. saying that, that the Poles actually invented a way of decrypting these things without ever having seen the machine itself. I know, and and people don't know that, and people should know this. Have you seen one? Because you, you work the, on this yes, stuff. Yes, yeah, so the, the Polish double, which is where they reconstructed what an Enigma machine must be, they had one at the Polish Institute, and I did do some work with the Polish Institute uh, a few years ago. I did a talk at the Polish Embassy about the Polish mathematicians. How did they do what they did at Bletchley Park then? How did that bomb technique that she mentions work in order to crack that code? And what was the nature of the code that made it so hard to actually grapple with? Okay, so there's two things that make Enigma difficult. First of all, there are lots of combinations. So I think we talked about there's lots of combinations, too many to check. But the other thing that makes it very difficult is the moving wheels. Now, inside Because at the simplest level, it's just substituting one letter for another, it isn't is. it? But it's, it's, is it, you're saying it's moving wheels. Is that because the substitution isn't the same every time? It's not exactly. Today, A is E, and tomorrow, A is Z. It's actually, right now, A is E, but next turn of the wheel, it's going to be D or something. You've got it exactly right. So when the wheels turn, each letter of the message is being sent with a different code, essentially, uh, which makes traditional code-breaking techniques impossible. So how did the bletchley Park team attack that? Yeah, so what they were doing when they built these large bomb machines, what it was doing, it was a process of elimination. So actually it was trying to work out the plug board, if I can tell you the truth, that's the little wiring at the front. And it was trying to work that out. If it found it was impossible, it would move on to another position. And if it was impossible, it would reject and it would reject and it would reject. And this process of elimination was actually faster. So whatever you can't reject must therefore be the correct answer. So in other words, what they're doing is basically a brute force attack on this thing. You you take what you've stolen as the encrypted message, try what you think might be the solution and, and see if you can decode it. Just one step cleverer than brute force because once you reject one answer, there's a whole family of answers you can reject at a stroke. Oh, so you narrow down the opportunities mm-hmm. and so that speeds it up. So yes. how long was it taking them to do the average, to get the code for that day? So on a good day, you could check all your positions and find the correct setting in 20 minutes. Right. And, but then obviously the work began because then you've got to feed all of the messages you have intercepted in using that code and break them for that day. Yeah. And what the code breakers at Bletchley could do is they could be reading these messages, these secret messages from the German army before the Germans had a chance <laughs> to decode what they said. It's amazing you can do that. And how does everyone know what the settings will be for each day? Was that published somewhere so the German army knew what settings to use for what date? Yeah, so the Germans were given a key sheet, a large sheet of paper, and for each day of the month it told you how to set the machine for that day. Nice little story, the Navy would write those on blotting paper. So if your ship gets torpedoed and wet, that would wash away. That's how you keep the secrets of those code books. Now, people thought this was unbreakable. Obviously, it wasn't because the clever people in Poland and also at Bletchley Park did suss it out and they got to the bottom of it. Is it possible, mathematically, though, James, to make codes that are not 
unbreakable. Yeah, there is such a thing as an unbreakable code. Uh, so that is called a one-time pad cipher. And it's not that difficult to explain. I could explain it now. So you might have tried as a child a shift code where you shift the alphabet across. You might shift it three across or four across. So do you mean every time I should write A, I write C or D or Exactly, something? yeah. So if you shift it one, A would become B and a B would become a C. Now there are 26 possible ways we could shift the alphabet. Now, a one-time pad does the same idea, but it uses a different shift for each letter of the message. So well, that's what Enigma does, isn't that it? Was, exactly, that's what it has in common with Enigma. Now, if you do that, uh, me and my friend, we have to share that sequence of shifts. Then my friend can just reverse it and get the message back. But the vulnerability is that I could, I could find out what that series of shifts is because someone else knows it. Yeah, if you can steal that key, absolutely, yeah, that's one of the problems. But if you steal the code and don't know the key... You'd have to try every possible shift on each letter of the message. What you get is every possible decryption. What you're doing is taking each letter of the message and you're allowed to shift it as many places as you want. Now, if you don't know and you just try every possibility, oh, you, you will could make get it say every anything. possible message. Oh, that would be nasty, wouldn't it? Is anyone yeah. actually using that? Is that in industrial I use? I have heard that it is something that is used between the president of Russia and the president of America. I can't believe Trump and Putin are sat there doing their one-time pad ciphers. <laughs> but it is something I've heard. But it is slightly impractical as a code. The closer we can get to that idea in principle, though, the closer we are to an unbreakable code. And did you have a, a code as a, as a kid? Because, I mean, people like Samuel Pepys wrote his diary in code, Julius Caesar wrote in code. Did you have a secret James I Grime did. code as I a kid? I did. I used to write my uh, words backwards and put a Z at the end. And I thought, ah, <laughs> oh, no one will ever be able to break my secret code. And? Uh, oh, of course, no one did. No one cared. <laughs> <laughs> so it was more unimportance than, <laughs> yeah. than, than data impenetrability that was your vulnerability. James, thank you very much indeed. That's James Grime, mathematician at the University of Cambridge. And next up, Adam is back with Elizabeth Bruton down at the Science Museum in London. Spycraft and encryption moved on after World War II. And eventually, we landed in the James Bond Cold War era world of spycraft, with spies around every corner and hidden messages shrunken down on tiny pieces of microfilm. But how ridiculous is that, really? The Portland spy ring was one of the most successful Soviet spy rings in Britain during the Cold War. It consisted of five people, but the two people who were particularly interested in were Helen and Peter Kroger. They were ostensibly a Canadian couple living in Ricelip in North London, that well-known centre for spying. Uh, he was an antiquarian bookseller, she was a housewife, but they were actually American communists spying on behalf of Soviet Russia. They were using powerful radio sets and micro dots, that is where you photograph a document or image and you shrink it down to the size of a full stop so you can send it in books and letters and so on. Um, and they were using those to send top secret naval documents back to Soviet Russia, particularly relating to Britain's nuclear submarine programme. The spying was detected and then arrested in January 1961. All five members were imprisoned. All of their homes and other locations were searched for the spy craft that they were using. And we have a number of the examples on display. We have their radio set, which they would have used to communicate with Soviet Russia. You still have to hide, though. Keep your top secret Soviet spy ring under the radar, so to speak. How would you go about keeping yourself secure? They believed that by locating themselves in Ricelip, that their wireless messages, which were sent in high speed, sort of Morse code bursts, um, would be undetected because they were near RAF North Holt, which would have had a lot of wireless traffic as well. That wasn't indeed the case. But nonetheless, we still don't know what naval secrets they stole, specifically because the documents were taken out, photographed and then returned. They were all imprisoned. Some of them ended up going back to Soviet Russia. But it's a really fascinating piece of Cold War history and one which really captured public attention. There were books and plays about it at the time, newspaper headlines which we've plastered over the outside uh, of a replica of their house. One, for example, Villa was wireless station for aspiring. It just really captured people's public sort of attention and, and sort of concerns about what spycraft is available and can you trust people to be who they say they are. How would you even know where to look on a document like this if you got your hands on it though? They would have hidden it in books or letters that would have gone on a circuitous route back to Soviet Russia and they would have sent wireless messages in advance telling 
people in Russia where to look um, and where to find it. And that would mean the letters could be as innocuous as you like, the message hidden in a full stop. Yep, so, um, you know, the letter or the books could have been anything. And since uh, Peter Kroger was an antiquarian bookseller, it was quite par for the course for him to be sending books out to all over the world. That's the Cold War, though. That's a long time ago. When it comes down to the best standards of encryption, the smartest thing to do is to take us humans out of the equation entirely. So we're standing in front of a case that contains lots of different objects, modern and not so modern. At the back we have things that look like very small scrabble tiles, but they have numbers rather than letters. And these were used by government code and cipher school staff at Mansfield College in Oxford, where they created secure systems. And the reason why they had these tiles uh, was that they would put them in a bag and they would encourage staff to take one out to try and create a randomly generated number in the best way that they had available at the time during the Second World War in order to create one-time pads and to create secure systems. However, what we've learned since then, and we have other more modern electronic systems here, including one uh, used to load keys onto an RAF Typhoon aircraft on loan from the Ministry of Defence, is that human beings and also computers are absolutely terrible at generating truly random numbers, strings and so on. We seem predisposed to patterns. Computers are very good at calculating you know, large numbers and so on, but not great at actually truly creating randomly generated numbers. So next to that display case, we have a chaotic pendulum, which is used by internet security company Cloudflare, along with other devices that sort of gather information from the environment around them. So they have lava lamps, which are on display in the Cloudflare lobby, and they use other sort of environmental measurements to create truly randomly generated numbers, which are incredibly hard for computers to break uh, because there is no passion to them, because they are utterly random. And some of these are used to underpin the security of the internet and indeed to keep our communication secure today. Elizabeth Bruton there, curator of the Top Secret Exhibition in the Science Museum in London. Well, to consider how we keep modern technologies secure today, we're joined by Cambridge University computer scientist Marcus Kuhn. So, Marcus, do they really use a lava lamp to generate random numbers like that? Not really. The lava lamp is a bit of a PR gag, but it does illustrate that there is a problem that computers have. Computers are very deterministic devices. They do each time you ask them something to do exactly the same thing. So it's actually a problem. How do you cause a computer to generate a random number? If, for example, you have devices that come off the end of a production line, there have been problems with things like internet routers, internet of things devices that had actually quite a lot of similar keys. I'm with you. So, you know, when you build a security camera thing that's on a production line, the flaws in whatever the system are that makes it choose its secret number, that flaw is going to make all of them make a similar mistake choosing similar numbers that make them more crackable. There have been studies where people scanned the secret keys used by millions of internet cameras and they did find thousands that actually used the same key for that reason because the manufacturer didn't have a lava lamp or some other (laughs) secure mechanism to create the random numbers well. So how do they then get around this? What are they using? So mouse movements are pretty good. You computer, can't. You're telling example, me on a production line there's a bunch of people wiggling a mouse like on, that. On a, pr- on a production <laughs> line, uh, if it's a microprocessor that goes into one of these routers, Internet of Things, things the, the most modern ones actually have a special hardware random number generator on the chip and what they normally use is a noisy amplifier so they build a deliberately a bad amplifier and like a microphone input and then they just sample the noise that comes out of that analog electronic amplifier for a second or so that makes the random noise that's the randomness yes in recent years there's been a really big shift towards encrypted connections on the internet so when you go onto facebook or you go onto your email nowadays we're looking for https and little padlock icon what does that actually mean so there's three things going on that the https protocol does it encrypts your connection it provides you with confidentiality so if someone taps your phone line they can't actually see what you're doing on the network it protects the integrity of the connection so it prevents someone 
to modify the data and it protects the authenticity of the connection. So for example, if you go to the website of your bank, you can be assured that this is actually the genuine bank's website and it's not the mafia having copied the bank website and redirected your traffic to it in order to steal your password. How, how would you know though, or how would you defend against the fact that let's say I, I set up a, a, a hotspot somewhere, a Wi-Fi hotspot, and Adam comes along and he connects to it and does some online banking and you're his bank. But let's say I actually, I take the data he's sending and I fool him into thinking he's got a secure connection because I make one to him. And meanwhile, I take what he sends to me and I, I send this to you, the bank, and you both think you're talking to the right person, but actually I'm copying all the information that's flowing between the two of you. How, how is that defended against? This can be done. This is known as a grandmaster chess attack because a very similar trick you could play to pretend to beat a grandmaster in chess where you just have two chess games with two different chess masters and you just pass their moves on to each other and both of them think they are actually playing with you whereas you are actually causing them to play against each other and in cryptography this is also known as a middle person attack so it's quite important that there is some confirmation of the authenticity that both of these communications are actually using the same keys. And this is done using something called a digital certificate to digitally sign the host name, the name of the computer with the key that's being used by your bank, for example. And there exist organizations called certification authorities that publish a kind of phone book of which organization is using which keys what your web browser does is it makes essentially this kind of telephone book look up. Does the key that's being offered by your bank actually match the official key of that bank? But if my web browser can do that, a criminal can do that, can't they? What's to stop a criminal just looking up these keys and then emulating or copying them? They can look up the public key, but the public key is only useful to verify the authenticity the public key cannot be used to actually sign the data packets that come across. For that, you need the corresponding secret key, but that is being kept by the bank. So there's a piece of information in the bank computer that the criminal does not have access to. What are the criminal masterminds doing to try to outwit this? Most attacks against these systems on the, on the internet today are not actually breaking the cryptography because the methods have become extremely secure, extremely sophisticated, they mostly trick the users into not paying particular attention. They, for example, will change the name of the computer to sound similar to your bank, but actually some of the letters are from a different alphabet. So there have been cases where the name of a, a well-known bank has been spelled in the Cyrillic alphabet where some letters look identical and people didn't realize they're actually talking to a slightly misspelled version of your bank. So it's quite important that you very carefully look at the name of your bank in this bar above the web page. And just in finishing, Marcus, are there three top tips you could offer our listeners for the best way not to fall prey. Using a password manager, using separate password on every website is probably really the top one. The second one is whenever you enter a password, make sure you first check the address that this is exactly the address that you are expecting, for example, the, the name. The third most important tip is whenever you receive unsolicited email, be extremely suspicious of any links in that email because very likely this is a, a fraudulent email and it's just designed to lure you into a fake version of the company's website. Sage advice, Marcus. Thank you very much indeed. That's Marcus Kuhn and thanks to our other guests this week, James Grime and Elizabeth Bruton. So hopefully you now understand a bit more about code breaking, Enigma and the importance of staying safe online. And we just have time for this digestible answer to an impossible question from Anthony. When pasta or rice is added to boiling water, there is a sudden surge of the boiling water to the point that the pot boils over with bubbles. Why is this? Ah, the classic pasta water, rice water surge. Enemy of carb lovers everywhere. 
I got in touch with Philip Broadwith, business editor of the Chemistry World magazine, and he said that to understand this, you first have to understand how boiling works. Boiling is the process of a liquid turning into a gas. It starts with a tiny bubble formed by a small amount of water vaporising into steam. Usually it's some kind of imperfection in the bottom or sides of the pan. When the bubble is big enough, it detaches from the bottom or the sides and rises up, growing bigger as it rises and bursts to the surface. Those bursting bubbles are what you see when the water rolls and boils. But how aggressively the water boils is determined by the temperature and the number of sites where bubbles can form. If you have water that's hot enough to be boiling, but doesn't have a lot of surface for bubbles to form on, it won't boil very hard. But if you suddenly add more surface, for example by adding pasta or rice, then a lot of bubbles will form all at once, so you get that big surge. This phenomenon can be particularly spectacular if you superheat the water in a very smooth container. For example, a mug in a microwave oven. It's then possible to get the water well above 100 degrees C without boiling. But then, if you add coffee granules, you can get a huge surge of boiling, which can be quite dangerous as it'll spit scalding liquid all over you. So boiling happens a lot quicker once there are lots of corners and edges and surfaces where the bubbles can form. Regular forum user Alan Calvert got to the same answer, but he also said, if the added material contains starch or gluten, the bubbles can form a strong mat instead of bursting at the surface, so the next group of bubbles pushes the mat upwards and the pan boils over. So, there's a second dimension to this. Rice and pasta both contain starch and gluten, and that's why you sometimes get that foam on the top, which adds to the boiling over problem. For rice, there's an easy fix that I myself approve of, rinse it, and do it properly in a bowl rather than a colander multiple times until the water runs clear. This gets rid of a lot of the loose starch particles on the surface, which will also make your cooked rice less sticky. Even better, cook your rice by the absorption method, which starts with the rice in a measured amount of cold water and heats it gently with a lid on until it's absorbed all the liquid. Thanks, Philip. I'm off to make dinner. Next week's nail-biting question comes from John. If enough people in the world donated their finger and toenail clippings, could enough keratin be produced to satisfy the demand and thus stop poaching of wild animals in Africa? So what do you think? You can email chris at thenakedscientists.com, find us on Facebook, tweet at Naked Scientists, or join in the debate on the forum, thenakedscientists.com slash forum. And that's where we must leave it this week. Do join us next time, though, when we're going to be getting crystal clear all about the world of glass, finding out how to make it, where stained glass comes from, and how to make it bulletproof. So join us next week to find out. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and it's supported by the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith and thank you at home very much for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.